Hi and welcome to episode 18 of Understanding Dark Table. Something a little bit different this episode. On the Facebook group Dark Table Unofficial, uh, a fella called Anders Lund put up an image, a raw file, and basically put it out there for anyone to download the raw file and process it the way they saw fit. And I thought, what a great idea, and you know, we should all do this a little bit more. And it just so happened that I have an image that, I can't remember if I've shown you this image before or not in this series of uh, videos, but it's an image that I shot in Vanuatu uh, in 2006 of some kids on a beach. You'll see it in a sec. And this has been a love-hate relationship for me for the 12 odd years as, as it is now, uh, since I shot this image. Partly because I screwed it up. It was very much a capture the moment kind of thing, and I blew the highlights horribly. Uh, this is the image as it came out of camera. And as you can see, the white water you know, that's breaking on the beach is completely blown. A lot of the cloud detail is lost. And I have gone back and reprocessed this image over and over, you know, through Lightroom in the days when I was working in Lightroom uh, and then multiple times in Darktable in the last couple of years. And, you know, what really blew me away and one of the things that really got me excited about Darktable was that I was able to get better results with Darktable on this image than I ever got with uh, Lightroom, but I was still not 100% happy. And so, when Anders put this image up, I thought, let's give that a go. Let's see how somebody else might tackle this particular image. So I put this image up and let people have a go at processing it to see how they might interpret it. Now, a lot of people kept the group of kids on the beach centered in the frame. Some people chose to crop slightly off center, like Matthias here. Canis Lupus went for a sort of a lower right-hand corner interpretation. But the thing that was consistent amongst all of them was the fact that the water was pretty blown out. Until N. James Elvis Njiru. Uh, James, if I've butchered that pronunciation, mate, my apologies. <laughs> and I looked at this image and went, what? How? How? How did he get all that detail back? Because believe me, I have been over this image multiple times. And uh, you can see from the thread, you know, we talked about what he'd done and how he'd managed to get the results. Long story short, I had him send me the XMP sidecar file. And that's what I want to discuss. I've ended up using James's XMP sidecar file with this version of the image now. And I've just sent this off to be printed as a new canvas. It's going to be uh, a two to one aspect ratio, 50 centimeters by 100 centimeters. And I cannot wait to see this. Now, when I looked at the sidecar file that James sent me, and I'll load it up on this duplicate image here. So we'll go load sidecar file, photos drive, family 2006 over 517, and we'll find James, open it up. So this is the version that James posted to the Facebook group. And as you can see, there are 50 steps in his processing. Now, I personally wasn't a fan of the color rendition of this. I've long felt that this image wanted to be a black and white. And I looked at this and just went, I am stunned at all this detail that he brought back in both the clouds and in the water. And I went through all of these processing stages and one, I was absolutely blown away by the fact that in not one single module out of these 50 steps did James once 
use a mask. Not once. Not a single mask anywhere. It was all just, you know, each module was processing the entire image and that was it. And I honestly cannot pin down what one point did the magic to bring back the detail in that water because I honestly thought it was baked. So what I did was I jumped back to somewhere around about step 37, 38 here where he'd switched the monochrome module off. And I looked at that and I thought, okay, let's go to monochrome because I'd prefer to see this as a monochrome image. And so what I thought I would do with this particular video, because although I've already done it, I'm going to try and recreate what I did in real time. So I wanted monochrome, so I switched on the monochrome module. And now I've got monochrome and I've got all that detail in the water and I love that. And I wanted the two to one crop. So I went with a two to one crop and because I didn't really shoot that straight, just gonna give that a little bit of a rotation like so. Uh, I'm gonna move the water up to the upper third and I'm gonna commit to that. Now, one other thing that I have always had an issue with with this particular image was the curvature of the water and that's just a failing of my lens I, I think this was shot with just a cheap kit lens and it didn't particularly keep a straight line on the horizon and what I found through investigation uh, even though it was a Sony Minolta lens, like a Konica Minolta lens, uh, I found that the Tamron 17-50 to did a really good job of straightening that horizon. There we go. It's still not perfect, but it is better than it was. So I applied that lens profile. Now, the last thing that bothered me with this image as beautiful as the processing was that James did on this image, was there seemed to be, throughout this area here in the middle, a little bit of, I don't know if blooming is the correct term, but like the highlighted areas through here on the water, on the sand, and a little bit in the sky, just felt like a bit of a halo. And you can really see it in that small thumbnail version up there in the top left hand corner. And so I thought I'd really like to pull that haloing effect out if I can. And so I thought what I would do there is I would create a duplicate tone curve. Where's my tone curve? Go new instance. And I'm deliberately going to start off by setting this as a drawn and parametric mask. And I'm going to draw the mask before I even try to dial in the curve. So what I want is a point from up there. Down here I'm going to do a control point because I want a sharp corner. And then I want another sharp corner there. And then I want it to come down to about there. And then control click, control click and right click and close that off. So now the mask, well, the mask won't be showing anything yet because at the moment we're processing all pixels within that area. But what I want to do is only process the brightest parts within that area. So I'm just going to go something like that. Just bring a bit more back into it. And then what I want to do is simply reduce the intensity of those brighter pixels, like so. Now, if we get out of that, have we got rid of that halo? We have, pretty much. There's maybe a little bit left in there, but it's enough that I am happy with the improvement. There's before, 
And if you're not seeing it here, have a look at the thumbnail version. It becomes a really apparent in that thumbnail version. And then if we switch that back on, yeah, that's done a nice job of removing that halo. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. I absolutely take my hat off to James and the work he did in recovering the detail in that water because seriously, I thought there was no way this was ever gonna look like this. Uh, so yeah, James, fantastic effort, mate. Much appreciated. Okay. I think that will do it for uh, this episode. When the canvas arrives, I'll shoot some video of it uh, when it's hanging on the wall, just so you can get an idea of how that's come up because I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to it. Now, in the last episode, I think it was the last episode, the crop and rotate tool episode, uh, I received a message from Masood via the YouTube channel uh, talking about how you can use the control and shift keys in conjunction with the sliders on the parametric mask to see an overlay of that particular channel and I was struggling with actually making that work and I said I wasn't sure if it was something I was doing wrong or if it was something to do with the config of my system. Masood came back to me and he said regarding the control and shift keys in the parametric masks. Actually, they're pretty consistent for me, but I admit that they are a little hard to use. After seeing your try with them, I think I know the reason why they don't work consistently for you. Please notice that you must hold these keys, one or both, before moving the mouse to the slider area, e.g. the input slider. So try this. Move your mouse pointer away from the slider, press the control key and hold it down, move the mouse pointer over the slider, now you can release the control key and the view will stand until you move the mouse pointer away from the slider again. You can click on the triangles and move them, but be careful not to accidentally move the mouse pointer outside the slider area. Hope this helps. All right, let's give that a go and see if it works. Okay, so this is a multi-image pano that I also shot on that trip to Vanuatu. Uh, let's just uh, activate the good old monochrome module. We'll put it into a parametric mask. And let's suppose we wanted to do something crazy like that. So hold down the control key, then mouse. Ah, look at that. So Masood, you are on the money, my friend. Bang on. So there you go. The moment you move away, it drops out. Hold the control key down, mouse over the slider, and you can then tweak that value. But if you move your mouse south, it automatically drops out. Yeah, okay, beautiful. Masood, thank you very much. Much appreciated. I also needed to address Derek's question from the last episode because what had happened was, Derek had said he had two questions and on the YouTube comment thing, the, this last paragraph was actually hidden. So I thought the second question was how to use the four points on each slider, right? Because what are the two sliders for and how to use the four points? So I just thought, oh, they're the two questions. And it was only later on that I accidentally discovered that, oh no, there was this whole other paragraph of Derek's uh, question that I hadn't seen. So apologies, Derek. Another question on a different function is how to draw details from the shadows without changing the hues. I'm finding the sky colors tricky to handle. Derek, I've got to say I'm a little hesitant to touch this because I get the feeling it's going to be very image specific. And it would depend on what tool you were using to bring out those shadow details. My natural inclination would be to start out with the shadows and highlights tool, but you may not be using the shadows and highlights tool. You might be using tone curve or you know any other possible thing. That's the beauty of Darktable. There are so many tools that you can use to achieve similar results. So you know, drop me a, another comment or an email and uh, let me know what tool it is that you're using 
and I'll do my best to address it. I would just like at this point to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the first episode. I make no claims to being an absolute expert in dark table okay i'm just a guy who's been using it for a couple of years i love it i think it's a phenomenal piece of software admittedly some of the ui is a little challenging uh, and you certainly got to know your your stuff to know which parts of the ui respond in what ways but beyond that i think it's phenomenal uh, but i make no claims to being an expert so if i can help i absolutely will uh, my email by the way i I think I mentioned it in the first episode, maybe I didn't, is studio at brucewilliamsphotography.com. Alrighty, that will do it for another episode, and I am trying to work up to doing an episode simply about noise reduction, because like everything else in Darktable, there's more than one way to skin the cat, and I feel like I don't quite have enough of a handle on it yet to do it justice so I'm doing some reading and I'm trying to do some practice and even though I'm reading the manual there are things that the whoever wrote the manual has just kind of made assumptions about how much knowledge you should already have before you <laughs> started reading the manual and there just seems to be things that aren't really explained well and I wish I knew them better and could explain them and help you know I would love to contribute to the writing of the manual anyway it is what it is and I will do my best to uh, get to a point where I can actually produce an episode of this series where we just tackle noise reduction it's on the to-do list okay all right stay well talk to you soon bye